Right, okay, so we'll get started. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, uh, my name is Matthew Engelke. Uh, I teach in the Department of Religion and direct um, IRCPL. Um, so it's a real pleasure to welcome today Professor Iftikhar Dadi from Cornell University. Um, and Professor Dadi uh, teaches and researches uh, modern and contemporary art from a global and transnational perspective with an emphasis on questions of methodology and intellectual history. His writings have focused on modernism and contemporary practice of Asia, the Middle East, and their diasporas. Uh, he also uh, is working now on a book concerning uh, film in Pakistan and has worked on media and popular cultures of South Asia. Um, Professor Dadi is the author of uh, Modernism and the Art of Muslim South Asia, which was published in 2010 and won the 2010 Book Prize from the American Institute of Pakistan Studies. Um, informed by post-colonial theory and globalization studies, the work traces the emergence of modernism by selected artists from South Asia over the course of the 20th century. More broadly, it offers a way of writing histories of non-Western modern art by situating modernism as transnational rather than located primarily within a national art history. Other publications include um, the co-edited catalog Lines of Control and the co-edited reader Unpacking Europe. Um, and his essays have appeared in numerous journals, edited volumes, and uh, online platforms to include, I think, South Atlantic Quarterly, is that correct? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, which yeah. is the, where I first uh, um, encountered his work. Um, so uh, in addition to being an esteemed art historian, uh, he, uh, Professor Dottie is also a practitioner with his partner, uh, Elizabeth Dottie, um, and their work investigates the salience of popular media in the construction of memory, borders, and identity in contemporary globalization, and the potential of creative resilience in urban informalities. Um, it has been uh, uh, exhibited around the world, including in, in um, uh, Brazil, uh, Australia, uh, Japan, the UK, and many other places. And we had a fascinating discussion earlier this afternoon about uh, neon signs and if you need to know where to get a really good neon sign and you don't get a chance to talk to him before he leaves, come see me because I know all about <laughs> it, uh, where you get the best neon signs, um, both in the United States and in Europe at this point. So um, it's, it's a real pleasure to have you here uh, with us at Columbia as part of this uh, three-year project on um, rethinking public religion in South Asia and Africa. Um, I, I'm, I'm very glad to have uh, another talk this year, this is the first of our talks this year, but another talk in the series focused in particular on, on art and aesthetics, which has been a, a real theme for us and I think is a really useful lens through which to explore notions of publicity and the, 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 the shapes in which, uh, uh, you know, the shapes that religion takes uh, or, or not, as the case may be. Um, so, uh, without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Dadi to, uh, to Columbia. And um, with, with a new title here, from, slightly different from... No, uh, no, Professor. this is the second, the this first PowerPoint, which was supposed to be the second PowerPoint. But I'm ah, not this is the second PowerPoint. Well, <laughs> okay. In any case, um, yeah. join me in welcoming Professor Dadi. Thank you, Matthew, for this very generous uh, invitation and introduction. And uh, uh, thank all of you for coming. Um, many uh, friends here. Um, um, so uh, I, this part is partly uh, partly stuff I've published, and partly uh, some of it is kind of speculative. Uh, and um, so, um, and uh, you know, Matthew mentioned the kind of uh, you know in his series the. Uh, bringing kind of people who work on art and aesthetics, but I would say equally it's the case that people who work on let's say contemporary contemporary art and aesthetics and visuality have a lot to learn from, uh, you know, from other disciplines. So I really think that this is a uh, you know a conversation that needs to happen both ways, and uh, I'm I'm you know I that I would very much appreciate your thoughts and feedback on uh, the material I'm presenting today. Um, so just. Um, 
you know because uh, some of uh, the what I do uh, uh, you know kind of in a sense deals with issues of methodology I wanted to begin with this rather kind of uh, programmatic uh, PowerPoint okay <laughs> which is to think about you know uh, what really uh, you know how one would think about the question of Islamic art and its relation to modern and contemporary art right so um, um, uh, so uh, f I would begin by saying that Islamic art is neither it's neither Islamic nor art okay and uh, let me explain what that is it's not Islamic because it's not primarily an art that is uh, 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 that is a, a premised on religious uh, 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 iconography, unlike Christian art or Buddhist art, for example, right? Okay, and nor is it art in the sense that when we think about art, uh, the way it developed in the meaning of art we ascribe to art today is the meaning that developed out of uh, the post-Renaissance context, right? And uh, which which attaches certain ways of thinking about art, and that's what we kind of inherit as meaning and uh, what happened in basically uh, when Islamic art was being uh, was being fashioned as a kind of a, as, as a topic or as a category that is the age of colonialism and imperialism okay and uh, this is the age when uh, the arts of the non-western world were primarily seen as lesser right so so uh, in, in when European art which is figurative okay which is uh, which which uh, which which uh, which handles you know issues of perspective and realism okay were seen as you know as high art right and also from a kind of a Kantian point of view it's the art that is a uh, uh, in which one has a disinterested uh, judgment right whereas things that are um, that are utilitarian would be uh, would be would be a part of the decorative arts okay and uh, those were lesser in the European hierarchy, the, the arts that were higher, the fine arts were painting and sculpture and architecture, right? Whereas the, the decorative arts were uh, a lower category, right? So it's in that sense, it's neither is Islamic art as a category, as an analytic category is neither, I would say. And it's better to begin with, with, a, with, a, with this kind of a, a kind of an anti-foundationalist approach, right? Um, also what you have in the, in the, in uh, what we understand to be Islamic art is that, um, so I would say it's a ca kind of a catechistic, uh, you know, uh, term. It's a signifier that's not adequate to its referent. Okay, um, and uh, so it's a uh, it's a category that emerges with the formation of art history as a discipline, right? So this is very much a kind of a disciplinary critique as well, and it's a discipline that consolidates itself in you know basically the you know from the enlightenment onwards right which is also the age of European colonialism right it's a discipline that uh, structurally de denies co evilness to the rest of the world in the modern era right so when you look at standard textbooks of art history okay like Jansen or Gardner you know these are kind of these big you know thick textbooks on art history what you'll see is sometimes you'll see these timelines of art history you know and you will have like Chinese art and you know and Indian art, etc. They all seem to mysteriously end around the year 1800 or year 1850. Okay, <laughs> the only thing that continues is the European tradition, right? So then, you, then you have impressionism and post-impressionism and cubism and so on, right? So there's a way in which, um, in which you, you there's a kind of a, uh, you know, uh, the question of coevalness, which of course people like Johannes Fabian have, you know, have critiqued in his work, right? And um, so a modern developments mysteriously evaporate from art history, you know, around this time, right? Um, okay, and you see this in, you know, basically, there's also, I would say, a lack of discursive ground to the, to this uh, category of Islamic art, right? So in other words, that um, partly, and these are some, you know, statements by, uh, by art historians who work on Islamic art. So calligraphy, the arabesque, geometry, nomadic memories of textiles, unity in form and purpose, these are only some of the slogans around which an immense variety of experiences found simple explanations. Okay, and then a more recent, uh, ec ec you know, uh, account, which which looks at basically, you know, Islamic art and ornament, and says where does all this visual delight have some, does all this visual life have some deep, deeper significance, or is it just superficial eye candy? Okay, okay. So in other words, you know, what is the meaning behind it, right? Okay. Uh, or things like this, right? Islam continues to be a major force in world events, but Islamic art is generally said to have ended at the beginning of the 19th century, right? Uh, with the advent of European colonialism and the emergence of distinct national identities, right? So the question would be, how can Islam continue to be a major force in world history, right? Or world events, uh, you know, without, 
without an attendant, okay, um, you know, cultural, visual, artistic uh, formation, right? So that's a question, okay, um, that I would ask, right? And uh, so again, the kind of the uh, this uh, bullet point thesis that I'm presenting here, I, I can go more into this, but uh, okay. Um, so in other words, that um, categories that describe classical Islamic art lack like discursive ground. The reason also is that you don't actually have good explanatory texts on visual aesthetics within the Islamic classical tradition. You do have them in the case of, for example, in the description of literature, but not necessarily in the case of visual art, right? Um, okay, or architecture for that matter, right? Um, in modern art, the art is subject, sub existential or conceptual explorations are foregrounded, right? And an understanding of the modern as a dynamic process also brings to crisis any kind of fixity of form, so right? So in other words, part of Islamic art's kind of Cat, uh, task has been to categorize and fix and enumerate, right, and taxonomize. But what we are talking about the modern experiences is precisely the the continual fluidity and unfixing of you know uh, of uh, of categories, right? Okay. So um, so now I, what I would argue is that discursive and aesthetic ground is exactly what practice seeks, but never quite finds. In other words, rather than looking necessarily at theoretical uh, or methodological. Um, you know, a priori concepts, maybe it's good to look at practice instead, okay, and begin with that, okay, and rather than denoting a fixed typology of objects and style, the term be deployed as a provocation for the analysis of select modern and contemporary art, right, so in other words, rather than think about it in terms of identifying whether something is Islamic art or not, it's better to think of Islamic art as a, as a kind of an, uh, as a probing analytical category, okay. Um, and it's a shifting kind of, you know, terrain of struggle between artistic projects that critically reconfigure tradition and discourse that seek to situate this work, okay? And um, now, uh, the difference also between modern and contemporary, which I'll come to. So there are some art historians here, but uh, who, who will kind of, uh, uh, please forgive me, okay, for, <laughs> okay. So uh, in other words, uh, you know, wh when we look at art history in the, like the last 100 or 150 years, we uh, you know, there's uh, there's a way to think about it in terms of phases, right? So we, when we think of modernism, okay, we think of modernism really as in terms of Europe, we think of it as uh, maybe 80 or 100 years, right? Between about 1850 and 1950, okay, something like that, okay? Um, and um, what you have after that or what succeeds the modern period or the modern kind of way is contemporary art, which has a very different uh, stakes, okay, in terms of the way it makes art. So. Um, so if modernism is uh, is about uh, is about the denial of time, it's about um, it's about transcendence, it's about a kind of an aesthetic utopia, it's about creating a distance from the world, right? Um, a contemporary is um, is breaching all of that, right? It's becoming more worldly. It's becoming more. Uh, it's it is recognizing time as a very significant aspect of its uh, of its. Uh, of the way it thinks about it. And it's uh, many cases what is called post medium. It is no, no longer necessarily tied to let's say painting and oil painting and you know, and other forms that, uh, that modernism was really invested in. I mean, this is a very schematic, um, you know, and a, a very, uh, you know, very schematic and very binary way of uh, dividing the two full of problems, but nevertheless, I think it may be good to at least place on the table, right? So. So in some ways, what I would say Islamic art today, to the degree that we may want to use the term, you know, and there are perfectly good reasons for not using the term, okay, <laughs> okay, has a kind of a hallucinatory and hallucinatory and cataclysmic charge. Its fixity, especially for the modern era, is constantly under stress and erasure. And I would say this is a productive critical position, right? It's a, and especially it's a productive position for practitioners, okay. So, um, and. Uh, uh, and uh, what I would say is that there may be two broad ways we may think about, you know, this term for today, okay? So one might be the interrogation of problems, stereotypes, and closures around Islamic art as a formal critique, right? Um, so artists expands its mediums, right? Um, its thematic range, okay? Um, to include other kinds of, you know, kind of themes in it, okay? Issues of social justice, feminism, etc. This reworking can also have social implications, but many of these may be allegorical or metaphoric rather than being addressed directly, okay? And uh, it should not be evaluated on whether one is Muslim or not or whether where one resides, but rather whether the work critically engages with the tradition of Islamic art, right? So for example, if uh, 
if there are artists who rework the Islamic carpet, right, then the Islamic carpet has already been inherited as, the, and as, as an example of Islamic art. So there's a way in which artists can take a position okay, against it or in relation to it. Okay. Um, and uh, the second uh, thing I would say is that the examination of another way we can think about Islamic art, you know, is the predicament of being Muslim today in complex and impossible ways, right? With, which may include all these dimensions of, you know, belief, ritual, culture, law, nationalism, gender, repression, okay? And this, this is not necessarily a celebratory uh, position, right? Uh, to, be a, to be an artist who to engages with whatever aspect of Islamic art is a burden and a problem rather than a celebration, okay? That's another thing I would argue, right? And um, it can maybe very current or globalist, one may be deeply engaged with local or long-term processes, okay? And it, again, not subject to one's belief or location, right? And can notate Muslim becoming, that is uneven, crisis-ridden, inflected by location, along with, you know, and exists along with other subjectivities, you know, democratic, secular Marxist, queer, et cetera, et cetera, right? Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, and these, these may be at play simultaneously, multiply, even in a single, in a, even in a single work of art, okay? Um, so, uh, uh, so it is uh, not to talk about, uh, about uh, one single totalizing explanation, right? Rather, th rather than as a kind of a, as an, as an operator that does work, right? Um, rather than just simply a taxonomy. Um, decolonization through practice, and this is some of the things I'll be talking about. So, uh, in other words, partly the, you know, the, the question of the eye candy, is, uh, you know, what do you do with that, right? So it, it can't be purely decorative or ornamental anymore. Artists deny pure decoration or ornament through various strategies, okay? Uh, subjective expressions are foregrounded, negating the artisanal anonymity, okay, of the decorative arts that was, you know, equated with the classical Islamic art. And artists record traditional slogans that stereotypically characterize Islamic art, which are things like, miniature painting, calligraphy, ornament, that you would typically associate as kind of, uh, you know, things that uh, that Islamic art does, right, or was uh, associated with. Okay, and the artists also bring new values in their works, right, which are drawn from transnational modernism, avant-gardist practices, and from recordings of the Islamic art, uh, of the Islamic part. So, for example, um, you know, people, people claim to whatever degree of, you know, whatever, I mean, that Islam is about social justice, right? But Islamic art was actually never about social justice, okay? So, so does now the fact that social justice becomes an issue in contemporary practice, is this, a, you know, a way of reclaiming that category, okay? Um, and uh, artists enrich the tradition of Islamic art with new themes absent and avoided in, in, uh, in uh, pre-modern Islamic art. Um, okay, issues of violence, issues of the body, issues of feminism, okay? Etc. Okay. Um, okay. So this is. Uh, so, so I apologize for the programmatic aspect of this, but this may help us to, you know, um, uh, in the in the much more traditional lecture presentation that I will switch now. To, okay. Um, I want to begin with, with an example of an artist that whom who, whom I worked on, and um, he, uh, his name is Anwar Jalal Shamza. He, he was born in 1928, died in 1985. And I want to uh, place him just very briefly. I'll discuss his work because I, I really want to get to Rashid Arain, who will, who in, in some sense, when he arrived in Anwar Jalal Shamza moved to England in 1956, okay, uh, from Pakistan. Uh, Rashid Arain arrives in London in 1964. So he comes eight years later, okay. And when he comes to London, he is in the beginning very much, uh, you know, seeks out Anwar Jalal Shamza and uh, you know, Anwar Jalal Shamza is a kind of an exemplar to Rashid Arain, but we'll see how Rashid Arain's practice begins to differ, okay? And uh, so, uh, so in some sense, Anwar Jalal Shamza will serve as a foil, okay, to the larger argument here. Okay, um, so um, Stuart Hall notes about the, about the, uh, you know, black British art, you know, black British art in, in the UK meant also anyone who was not white, any, you know, any artist who was not white. So it included South Asian as well, right? And he says the first generation was born in the 1920s and 30s in the far flung corners of the British Empire. They came to Britain as the last colonials in the 50s and 60s to fulfill their ambitions to become practicing artists. 
That is the leading figures of the second wave were not born until the 50s and 60s and did not exhibit their work until two decades later. Okay, so he sees uh, like phases of arrival of artists. Artists of the first phase came to London in a spirit in which Picasso and others went to Paris uh, to fulfill their artistic ambitions and to participate in the heady atmosphere of the most advanced centers of artistic innovation at the time. Uh, as colonials, they had been marginalized from such developments. In fact, they came to Britain feeling that they naturally belonged to the modern movement and in a way it belonged to them. The promise of decolonization uh, fired their ambition, their sense of themselves as already modern persons liberated them from any lingering sense of inferiority. Okay. And uh, you, would think, uh, you would think about um, artists like Ibrahim al-Salahi, okay, um, uh, who, who overlapped with, uh, who came to the slate in the 50s, okay, and when Jalal Shamza came to the slate in the 50s, okay, they all developed a kind of a, a practice of, um, of uh, I would say, modernism, right? So this is a sketchbook by Anwar Jalal Shamza. Um, he's working out, this is a painting by Anwar Jalal Shamza. This is a, called Love Letter One from 1969. This is an oil on canvas work, right? And he's thinking about, uh, thinking about calligraphy, thinking about script, thinking about questions of automatic writing, okay? And he's kind of, in a sense, creating, Okay, works that are, he's very much a studio artist, okay, and he's making works that uh, in, in some sense he, he, you know, one can really squarely place him as a kind of a modernist artist, right, creating works that are, um, uh, that, 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 that draw from his experiences, but then create that works that, uh, that have a utopian, a transcendent uh, uh, aspect of reading, okay, um, okay. Or uh, one of the last works he made was a, a, a series called Roots, okay, which is a, which are very small works in which you have a kind of a foliate form on the top and a kind of abstracted roots that look like uh, unreadable calligraphy, okay, in in um, in um, um, at, at, in the lower half. Okay, now um, this is a very important show that uh, that was. Uh, uh, this is the catalog cover of a very significant show in 1989. Okay, this was. Uh, called the other story. Um, 1989, in many cases, you know, there's another stereotype or another sort of line we can draw in terms of our timeline, which is to say that uh, uh, if you there are many many books today that says contemporary global contemporary art. Okay, after 1989. Okay, there's any number of books you can find, and so 1989 marks a kind of a, a significant. Uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, um, uh, era or a significant year, at least in the minds of many art historians, in in a transition uh, a, towards a, a kind of a more global way of thinking about contemporary art, right? And uh, there were other shows as well. There was a, the well-known Magicians' Dinner Fair exhibition, also in 1989 at the Pompidou, and then there was the Havana Biennial, okay, in 1989. So the, these three shows are kind of, in a sense, milestones that mark this year, right? And this is also the fall of the this is the fall of, you know, this is, this is the, this is the fall of the, of the second world, right? In other words, this is the fall of communism, uh, of, of the Soviet bloc, right? And the Berlin Wall and etc. right? This is, marks that juncture and mar marks the triumph of kind of neoliberal capitalism, okay, across the world. Okay. Um, Shamza's, so this is a show that was curated by the next person I'm going to talk about, which is Rashid Arain, uh, you know, who came eight years later to, to England, was friends with Shamza. He put Shamza's work on the cover of this catalog, okay? Uh, and, uh, but now let's move to, uh, move to, let, let me come back to this, okay? Now let's move to Rashid Arayan, okay? So he's born in Karachi. So he's actually, if you think about Stuart Hall's, um, you know, kind of, um, you know, first and second wave, Rashid is kind of somewhere in between. He's like generation 1.5 or something, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, okay. And uh, he's moved to London. He still lives in London, okay? And uh, so he first started making works in, uh, in, uh, in, in Karachi, he was from Karachi, and uh, he would make paintings, okay, um, and uh, so this is an early work by him from 1959, which, uh, um, but already you sense a kind of a sense of movement and uh, that, that is part of this work. It's an oil, oil painting, I'm sorry, I don't have it in color, okay. Uh, but he also did experiments like this, right? So he, uh, he would take bicycle tires and he would burn them, Right, and uh, what they would end up leaving is a uh, is a uh, the this, so apparently there are metal threads or metal wire in the bicycle tire. I did not know that. Okay, but uh, if you burn the tire, you get you get these uh, you get these cultural forms, right? Which uh, 
which are not unlike the the painting, right? Okay, these kind of undulating forms, right? Okay. Um, Something like this is not part of, this practice is, would not be part of modern, modernism. This is contemporary practice, okay, which we're talking about, uh, you know, a kind of a, a you know, uh, you, you're, you're, you're not working in traditional mediums like oil painting. You're working with anything that you, you know, you, and uh, this, uh, you know, there's a question of time here where, you know, fire is transformative and transforms it. There's a question of performance. There's also a question of, and this would be in line with movements that are happening like, uh, like happenings and fluxes, okay, that uh, that you can you can uh, situate this in relation to that. Although he uh, he uh, he did not know about those movements uh, living in Karachi. Okay, he when he moves to he's trained as a civil engineer. So when he moves to uh, to London, he begins to work out. Uh, so he's working as a civil engineer, but he begins to work out a series of uh, minim, uh, ge geometric relationships, right? Um, and uh, so this is a cube sculpture, a proposal that he's sketching out on this kind of graph paper, right? And um, and uh, there's a, a number of works that he creates, okay, based on that, which is uh, um, and uh, he has a gallery in New York City called Icon Gallery, and uh, so these are images from the sh a show he had from 2015. These are recent works, but they are basically from the same aesthetic as that he developed in the 60s, okay? Um, and uh, partly what you can do with the sculpture is that it looks like a it looks like a like a fixed form, but actually he wants you to play around with it. So he places them in playgrounds, and people can reconfigure them and carry them around, and so on. Right. So there's a way in which again he's bringing a kind of a, a notion of uh, a, you know uh, participation, okay, performance, okay, publicness, okay, to to otherwise what may look like a fixed uh, sculptural form. Right. So these are contemporary values, in other words. Okay. Um, or something like this, right? The, uh, these grids that he makes with the with his civil engineering training, right? And um, he um, and again, just to give you an idea of some of his work, okay. Um, now, when he makes his work, uh, this of the, in this vein, right? This is what he recounts. He says, a professor of fine art at the Slate School of Art during the late sixties asked uh, him at the opening, "Aren't you an Arab?" Um, he replied, looking at my face, no, I'm from Pakistan. I said, becoming rather puzzled by all this. Oh, it's all the same. You are Muslim. Okay. Yes, I said reluctantly. Okay. Uh, you see, this kind of work would only have been conceived only by a Muslim. I cannot imagine any European doing this work. He began to explain politely. Okay. Um, so, um, other works that uh, Rashid Arain does is, uh, is this performance where he, he makes these discs. Okay. These are... Uh, out of plywood, okay, and then he, you know, people, what they do is they fling them in the water, okay, and they float away. So uh, they form a kind of a, a kind of a constellation that constantly moves and as it as it floats away, right? So again, question of time, okay, question of sight, okay. Um, uh, so these works can, you know, if if you do this work somewhere else, it will be a different work because the sight is very important, you know, the buildings and the, and 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 the and the and the time of day and the and the climate and so on, right? So um, okay, let me skip this. Okay, uh, what happens with by the late sixties is that uh, him and uh, a number of other artists suddenly become radicalized, right? So uh, so their radicalization has been uh, percolating, okay, the, uh, in terms of you know feeling racism from the uh, British art establishment against their practice. It's frequently they don't get into shows. They get responses like that. Only if you're a Muslim, only then you can make this kind of work, right? This kind of. Uh, whereas he says, "Look, I'm a civil engineer. I want to be a modern artist, right? Why can't I just be a modern artist?" And the geometry that I've learned is based on my engineering training, right? Okay. Uh, but uh, so um, so him and other artists they suddenly become radicalized. Okay, this is part of the radicalizing atmosphere of. Uh, in, of the late 60s, okay, uh, like everyone discovers Fanon at the same time, right, suddenly, okay, okay, <laughs> and it's very transformative, okay, and uh, so he does this performance called, it's just called the Pakistan, Paki Bastard performance, okay, which is, uh, which is uh, from 1977, and uh, it's a, this is a kind of a still from that performance in which he's juxtaposing his minimalist sculpture along with uh, you know, uh, people who are victims of race riots in, in, in the UK, right? So it's bringing in, it's bringing in a kind of a, a, a form that is uh, timeless, if you will, right? That is transcendent kind of a form and bringing it in relation to uh, 
uh, everyday uh, events, right, which are political in nature, right? Okay. Um, okay. And uh, a, a series of works he makes called ethnic drawings, which are uh, which use the which use calligraphy, right? Which use Urdu calligraphy, okay? And uh, so he makes his own self-portrait, okay? He looks like that, and um, the the calligraphy is you know is not written in any kind of fine penmanship. It's kind of done in a very uh, uh, casual style, right? Um, and uh, uh, what he does in this is that he. Uh, uh, among the texts that he writes are uh, is uh, is a text that he calls the golden verses okay um, and uh, this is the text of the golden verses that is in urdu right so white people are very good people they have very white and soft skin their hair is golden and their eyes are blue their civilization is the best civilization in their countries they live life with love and affection and there is no racial discrimination whatsoever white people are very good people okay um, now uh, what you see is he does a series of billboard projects in 1990, right, which is, uh, you know, from this golden verses. So the golden verses are inscribed here, okay, in Urdu, okay, uh, on a quote-unquote Islamic carpet, okay, okay. And um, the translation in English is actually very tiny, it's in the margins here, in this kind of border, okay, which is barely, it's very hard to read. And um, so, uh, and you can see it's vandalized, right? It becomes vandalized and it's, it's, it's shown in many different sites, you know, near a mosque and um, in, uh, in public spaces, right? Billboard project. And you can see that um, it, it, it's, um, sorry, um, it's vandalized, okay? And in some ways, what, what the vandalism suggests is that you have kind of, let's say, vandalism in which you have Urdu text, uh, but you also have things like swastikas and so on uh, painted on the, on the billboards, right? So at some level, it doesn't give comfort. So the people who, the the Britishers who cannot read Urdu, okay, what do you think it looks like? Propaganda slogan or something. Yeah, or something, or yeah. you know, yeah, yeah like a scary Quranic text, okay, okay, okay. And for people who can read Urdu but don't necessarily understand that it's an ironic text, what do you think they will it will look like to them? Supremacist. It's a white supremacist, right? So in other words, it, it gives comfort to neither kind of community. It's a kind of an unsettling, right? It's not a claim to identitarianism. It's rather a claim to displacement, right? And, uh, and the work does that. Okay. Um, um, and, uh, you know, he makes works about, um, about the first Gulf War. Okay, so this is a, this is a very, uh, this is a very, uh, iconic image of Saddam Hussein riding a white stallion. Okay, I've written a paper on this image also. Okay, which I separately from this. Okay, and uh, this is a an image that circulated a lot in 1990, early 1990s in in Pakistan. Okay, and uh, uh, in some ways, of course, it uh, it draws from you know Jacques Louis David's uh, famous uh, Napoleon crossing the Alps. Right, so. So Napoleon crossing the earth has had a long and rich kind of afterlife, if you will. Okay, <laughs> okay, as a as a you know started as a pro propaganda image and uh, it continued as a propaganda image. So I think it's a it's a good uh, use of it. Okay, uh, but something like this would be uh, what he's saying is again this is a minimalist grid. So it's a three by three grid, which you know this is what Rashid says about this work. Okay, in which he repeats. Uh, there are certain kind of televisual images that are repeated, right? And then you also have this green, which may signify a kind of Islam, right? But then you have a kind of a crucifix kind of a, a structure in it, right? So there's a way in which kind of a clash of, like the notions of clash of civilizations and, and it's minimalism, he's bringing them together kind of in this work. Okay. Um, now, um, so uh, this would be the... Um, this is kind of a, you know, a run through some of the work that, um, that uh, Rashid Arain does. Okay, now Rashid Arain, as I mentioned, is from that, I would say that generation 1.5. Okay, and now I want to switch to um, more contemporary developments. Okay, um, so, um, and the, the question of contemporary developments, and Rashid is, of course, lives most of his life in, in the UK, right, in, in the diaspora. And uh, there's, there's ways to think about the kind of work he does also by some of the artists in Pakistan, but I think Rashid presents a very kind of a clear and coherent example of, of, uh, of this transition, right, from modernism, from making the utopian, you know, kind of uh, form-based work to work that intervene in 
in, in, in everyday events today, right? Okay. And which are post medium, in which way they cross mediums as well, right? They're not simply about, you know, a metal sculpture or oil painting. They're about, uh, uh, they, they're bringing a lot of, um, they're, they're kind of more worldly in that way, right? Okay. Um, now, uh, one of the ways I'm thinking about this, uh, um, what's happening in Pakistan is to think about the work that anthropologist Navida Khan has done on Pakistan. So she says the creation of Pakistan inaugurated the aspiration to strive to be Muslim. This aspiration did not concern itself with final ends. Uh, the commitment to mus Muslim aspiration, the inaugural tendency of Pakistan to continual striving is a primary marker of becoming. A persistent quality of becoming within Pakistan was that it delivers up surprises, unsettling, established scholarly notions about Pakistan and social theory in general. Okay. Um, and um, further, she says, I see this mode of inhabiting Pakistan as one of allowing Muslim opportunities to um, in re inhabit Muslims' opportunities to re inhabit their tradition, to make it newly perfect. And through the interventions of Muhammad Iqbal, the poet and uh, Muhammad Iqbal, opening it up for travels in the virtual. I also see this promise as teaching about living with doubts and skepticism and learning to acknowledge their uh, presence and devastations in our midst. Okay? Now, one of the ways that uh, what I've learned from Navida Khan's book is that uh, um, you know, what she does in her book is to talk about um, actually, you know, kind of problems in Pakistan, right? So sectarianism, okay, and, uh, you know, uh, you know, clashes between various groups, right? Um, and, um, you know, for, for her, this, the, the way she's reading about this is that she's reading about this kind of an open-ended tendency by, uh, by uh, segments of the public, right? To count, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, counter publics and uh, various publics within Pakistan to articulate certain kinds of claims, right? Okay, and, uh, uh, because those claims are kind of, in a sense, open-ended, okay, the, 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 the problem of violence is always attendant, you know, in other words, they, 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 they have, in some ways, not playing on kind of liberal ground, right? If they don't play on liberal grounds, then the question of, you know, the rules of the game and the question of, uh, you know, public violence is attendant to this, uh, this experimentation, right? So this experimentation is not necessarily... Uh, an experimentation that is uh, that can be understood, okay, even or incorporated or even uh, uh, necessarily to my liking, okay. But uh, this is what uh, this is perhaps one way to think about it, okay. Now, how do artists fit in, right? So these are we're talking about religious groups, etc., political groups, okay. And I would say that um, artists have a contemporary artists have a very odd relation to 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 what is happening in society in Pakistan today, okay. It's very odd because on the one hand Contemporary art is almost kind of a world of its own, right? So the people who go to galleries, the people who understand the work, okay, this is not something that, uh, you know, is becoming bigger and wider, but it's still a, a kind of a, um, it's, it's a kind of a world of its own, if you will, right? Um, and it's a world of its own that has its own patronage structures, you know, there are collectors, there are galleries, etc. There are art schools where people teach, okay, there's ways in which people are trained. So there, there's a kind of a kind of a continuity, a kind of a, a a kind of certain kind of autonomy to to this world, right? Okay. On the other hand, of course, artists live in the society, right? So in some sense, how you know how do we think about, you know, what they what you know they may read the news and they may be disturbed by the news and then they have to go in in the studio, right? So in other words, what is that relation really about uh, about? Um, so let's let's first look at uh, the artist Rashid Rana, who's based in. Um, in Lahore, okay. Um, there's a number. There's a. I'm skipping a lot, but there's. Uh, Rashid Rana was trained by uh, a generation of artists who had turned towards a certain kind of a spare and minimal practice in in Pakistan. I'm thinking of people like Zahurul Akhlaq. I'm thinking of people like Lara, Lala Rukh, okay, who are who are both influential artists and teachers, okay, and. Uh, so he makes these kind of grid, you know, these grid paintings, okay. Um, and, um, but then, uh, you know, so this is uh, very much a kind of a, you know, it's a work on canvas, right. Um, it's a minimalist work on canvas. But uh, we can think about this work in relation to his later work, which is done, you know, in 2011, okay, um, which is called Language Series, okay. And um, 
And what he does in these language series is that these are photo mosaics. Okay, these are very these are large scale. These are large scale works. Okay, produced digitally, and um, they um, you know they combine kind of thousands of photographs right into these uh, into uh, uh, digitally combined right with through software in in this uh, kind of ensemble right. And uh, when we come closer, you see the what you see is actually that uh, in the language series you have. Uh, the walls of Lahore that are reproduced, okay, or aspects of the walls of Lahore that are reproduced, and these are um, so the walls of Lahore are very rich, right, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, you know being very active in terms of its uh, their visuality. And what you have is you have you have three kinds of um, um, you have three kinds of um, subjects, okay, or, or or slogans that are written on this, okay, and. Uh, in in this respect, I would uh, you know I know Kajri Jain was here, uh, like last year or okay. So uh, uh, this is something she's worked on in the Indian context to talk about the nexus of you know uh, you know capitalism, religiosity, and uh, and politics. Okay, uh, and you see that here as well. So you have basically you have you have small businesses that are advertising there. You know, uh, like Allied uh, Allied School. Okay, and uh, you know. Um, Lasani medical something okay so okay so you have kind of small <laughs> vernacular capitalists who are who, who cannot afford the big billboards who are advertising or by this thing is called wall chalking in Pakistan okay this is the term that is used in Pakistan okay then you have things like um, uh, religious slogans right by sectarian and religious groups which are also articulating their claims on 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 on, on the public walls and the third group you have are the uh, political parties Okay, small and large political parties that are also using the walls, uh, you know, for part of their sloganeering. Okay, now rather than seeing these things as distinctive, okay, uh, you know, how do we think about the question of the public space? Okay, um, which is, um, um, you know, in a, in a sense that, uh, you know, is would this be the Habermasian public space? You know, it, in other words, this is not the newspaper, this is not the the cafe. Okay, this is not the lecture hall. Okay, <laughs> this is the wall. Okay, and this is the wall that multinational companies will not advertise because they can afford the big billboards and the big advertisements, right? So what really happens to questions of informality, right? And questions of community and belonging that are not necessary, that don't have the same terms of legibility and recognition that we would accord to, let's say, the big political parties or the or big capital, right? Okay, um, so that would be one way to think about it, okay? Um, um, another artist that, uh, that I talk about is Naiza Khan. She was based in Karachi. Now she moved to England a few years ago. Uh, she did this work by uh, she would go in the around Karachi in very early in the morning, okay, and she would use these henna stencils. So, you know, henna is uh, you know this uh, for de decorating your palm. They, you get these stencils, and she would make the female figure, okay, in uh, kind of a fragmented female figure in public space, okay, in uh, in uh, early in the morning, right, in. Uh, and um, and uh, of course the henna you know fades with time. So this she did like maybe like two weeks before she did this one. So you can see this is already fading. Okay, <laughs> okay, and uh, and of course it's it's overlaying already existing you know kind of graffiti and you know kind of uh, you know slogans and so on. Right? Um, if you look at uh, 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 if you look at uh, the way she's thinking about the figure. Okay, and you look at the way that. Uh, Oscar Verkek, who's an anthropologist who's done work on violence in in, uh, in Karachi and uh, Hyderabad, okay, political violence, okay, and this is the figure of the scary terrorist, okay, that one of the political groups would would post would would, would create about their about about the, the their kind of machismo and their power, right? So the so the question of again publicness, they are in different sites. This is Hyderabad. This is Karachi, okay, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's no direct, uh, you know. Uh, inspiration, either way, right? But what do we make of this uh, kind of a juxtaposition, right? Okay, or something like this, right? So this is done right after September 11, right? This is 20. So this is a figure she's done, okay? And uh, this slogan says, uh, "This is done." There's going to be a, a march for the glory of jihad, okay, on the 24th September 2001, right? So right after 9/11, okay. Um, so what does it mean to think about the you know the question of uh, 
of, of, of the female body, it's, 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 it's presence in the public space, okay, in this kind of a charged, uh, you know, environment. And she's actually, Niza is actually trained in a very traditional, she's trained at the Ruskin School. So it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's a school that really emphasizes, let's say, academic training, right? So for her to kind of make this, you know, kind of get out of the studio is not a natural, you know, it was not part of her training, in other words, right? It's something that she had to kind of develop. Okay, and um, or something like uh, these works, which are um, which are uh, these chastity belts and these kind of armor, you know, lingerie and armor made out of metal, which she does, you know, for a number of years. But this this is a photograph from two thousand and seven. Okay, this she says I made these while I was reading um, this book called Behesti Zevar. Okay, so Behesti Zevar is. Called, it's a book that, you know, whose title can translate as Heavenly Ornaments. It was written by one of the most import, important Islamic scholars of the 20th century, okay, uh, whose name is Ashraf Ali Thanvi, okay, who was this polymath scholar and Sufi himself. Uh, but he wrote this book called Heavenly Ornaments, which is a reformist text on how to become a good woman, Muslim woman, right? So. Uh, um, and this is something that everyone would, you know, uh, there was a time when, uh, we, you know, whenever, a, a, you know, a woman got married, the part of her, what do you call it, trousseau, trousseau, trousseau would be uh, that she would get a copy of uh, Behshti Zeva, right, uh, which includes Naiza's grandmother, okay, um, okay, um, or, you know, uh, you know, a work from the same, from the same um, uh, time around 2006, okay, um, or when we look at somebody like Hamra Abbas, who's looking at, uh, who made this work, this work consists of two parts. There's a four, there's one photo, there's a single photograph, which is this one, okay? And then there are 99 small portraits, okay? Which are, she's trained as a miniaturist. So they're all like, like this small, right? They're tiny, okay? And there are 99 different ones. And um, the way she talks about this work is that uh, she would, she studied at the National College of Art, which is an important art school in Lahore. And she would travel this road every day, right, to go to school. And when she was going to school, she would see the names of the 99 names of Allah, okay, which are written on trees, okay, um, which are, you know, these little boards that are pasted on trees, okay. And, uh, and so she, she went to a madrasa or, a, you know, a, a, you know a, a school that, of course, has been kind of uh, come under a lot of pressure after 9-11 as madrasas has been the training ground for terrorists, right. Um, and she painted the kind of the individual portraits of 99 young children in there, okay. Um, or something like Imran Qureshi, okay, uh, looking at the work of, uh, he's again trained as a miniature painter, right, and uh, uh, the title opening word of this new scripture comes out of uh, Faiz Ahmad Faiz, who's a, who's a, who's a you know, a, 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 an Urdu poet, uh, you know, of, uh, of leftist orientation, but definitely even the, you know, this is, uh, this is, this is characteristic of Imran Qureshi's work. He's working a lot with imagery of blood uh, recently, but I'm, I'm actually equally interested in the title, okay, opening word of this new scripture. What is this new scripture, okay, that is uh, supposedly being inaugurated, right? Um, or a work he did in Singapore for the Singapore Biennial. He worked on a mosque, okay, so this is a mosque in, in Singapore. And uh, the title is called Wuzu. Wuzu means uh, the ablutions that, you know, people perform by washing themselves with water before saying the prayers, right? And uh, what he does is he looks at the way the, uh, he paints these foliate forms, okay, that, you know, that are in a sense flowing out of, uh, out of, uh, uh, you know, out of uh, structures, right? Um, uh, so Wuzu is a, is a sense of the, uh, the, the, the way the, the, when water touches your, your body and then, and then drains out, okay, the relationship between kind of the, uh, of water to the body and then it's kind of after, it's kind of afterlife, right? Um, um, and uh, here's the detail, right? Um, or Aisha Khalid, who's uh, also working in, in Lahore, uh, working a lot with the uh, Islamic pattern, but also this is, so this can be thought of as Islamic pattern. This can also be thought of as colonial tiles, right? So, you know, in, in colonial era buildings, you would have this kind of tile work on the floor, okay? And she's looking at the, at the, at the question of the, of the female figure, right? In, uh, you know, in the, which is both in, in some ways confined and defined also by, 
uh, by its uh, by by this overwhelming pattern, right? Um, or somebody like Muhammad Ali Talpur, okay, again a, a Lahore-based artist who uh, who who trained uh, privately with a calligrapher, okay, and has been doing this uh, writing the word Alif here, you know, uh, multiply, right? Um, and um, and uh, similarly here, again, this uh, kind of unreadable graffiti-like uh, kind of mark making, okay, that he does, okay. Um, and I want to go back and end with uh, with this statement. With uh, um, so now, now, just to just to end, I want to talk about um, the debates that, uh, that are actually happening in religious studies in anthropology, which is the post-secular turn, right? And what. How can we, you know, how can we make sense of this practice, or maybe not make, make sense of this practice in relation to these, these debates, right? And um, so, that, you know, this is Atalala says in an interview. He says, in my view, tradition is a more mobile, time-sensitive, more open-ended concept than most formulations of culture, and it looks not just at the past but to the future. A tradition is in part concerned with the way limits are constructed in response to problems encountered and conceptualized, there is always a tension between this construction of limits and the forces that push the tradition onto a new terrain, where part or all the tradition ceases to make sense and so needs a new beginning. Uh, there is a possibility of a new or revived tradition, a new story about the past, new virtues to be developed, and new projects to be addressed. Okay, um, So, I'll end here, but uh, you know, this is, uh, I hope this will, you know, I hope you have something to um, <laughs> Uh, comments or questions or um, yes, thank be you. very appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you so much. Um, uh, may I sit down? Scott. Yes, you okay. may. Yes, okay. of course you can. Um, <laughs> and uh, we'll give you your sign okay. here. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I, I wonder maybe if I can start. I'm sure there are going to be uh, a, a lot of questions. I wonder if I can start by just asking a, a, a basic question in relation to um, the Stuart Hall uh, yeah. um, uh, periodization yeah. that you were talking about and, and, and the work that he was doing with others in the Birmingham School of Cultural Studies. Um, uh, and it's, it's really just a question for kind of for information. Um, in this period, kind of 60s and 70s, especially when the two groups were maybe overlapping to a certain extent, yeah. the, um, the younger generation coming on on the scene. Right. Um, what I mean, there was a lot else going on in the UK with respect to to, to race and politics of identity, politics of culture. Um, to what extent were the the artists that you're talking about in that period? Um, in conversation with or not uh, other communities of Afro-Caribbean artists or, uh, or or others, um, you know, because yeah. um, Hall frames it partly in relation to, of course, uh, the empire, right, and, yeah. and the the far-flung corners of the empire coming together. Um, and I guess I just wonder if if there were kind of cross currents uh, mm -hmm. between different communities. Um, and, and if so, what that looked like, or if not, uh, you could speculate as to as to why. Yeah. So of course they come from different, you know. So there's, you know, in what we call Black British would be composed of, you know, like people from Africa, from Ghana, Nigeria, you know, uh, people from uh, the Caribbean, okay, Trinidad, etc., okay, and also people from South Asia, and there are others as well, right? So, so Malaysia and so on. There are smaller numbers. Of and partly what happens to them is that they get, uh, in some sense, they get, um, uh, so they all, uh, in, a, in, a, in other words, a lot of people came to the slate. In other words, if you were a foreign student of, uh, you know, probably of kind of a post, you know, kind of a British imperial territory, former, uh, then uh, you would, uh, in the 50s, you would go to the slate primarily, okay? Many Indian artists went there. And then you would also show in only certain spaces. So there was uh, the Commonwealth was a rubric under which uh, the shows would be organized, right? So in some sense, these people were, even though they may not have necessarily had anything in common earlier, um, when they when they first arrived, apart from being subjects of the British Empire, right? They in some sense get forced into similar uh, 
you know, they, they, they end up showing together in group shows or in the same galleries, or they see the same kind of structural constraints that, you know, the South Asian will face the same kind of structural constraints as the, as the person from the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, and it takes a while to form. So in other words, in the beginning, they all think, so in the earlier 60s, you don't have so much of a political, at least in the art world, it's not politicized, okay? The politicization only happens really in the sort of early 70s. And it, it becomes politicized very, very, quite rapidly, like within a year or so, okay? Mm -hmm. you, have a, you have quite a, a large shift that takes place in, uh, in the consciousness. And that's when the shift is that, uh, you know, if, if, if you keep applying for shows and don't get shows, you might think it's, I'm just a bad artist or I'm not good enough, right? Or, but then, you know, by the late 60s, there's a realization that this is a structural issue. Okay? It's not just about uh, that in, in some sense, the art world is, uh, the, deck, the deck is stacked against anyone who's, who's not kind of uh, coming from a canonical mainstream, you know, white, you know, British or European or American background. So, so that's, uh, that's the shift that happened. So in, in other words, this is the, I mean, Stuart Hall he has this essay called Old and New Ethnicities. So in some sense, you know, the formation of, I mean, black British is a new, it's an imagined mm. ethnicity, if you will, right? Um, and uh, it, it definitely becomes more and more like the, you know, by the, by the late 70s and the 80s, you have, you know, basically everyone is aware, everyone is politicized. You may not, you may not, not choose to be political. There are artists who are still working as artists, but you're not unaware that, uh, you know, these are issues that many other people are dealing with, so, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I'll open it up to the floor for questions. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, what a rich presentation. Um, I have two, two questions, if I may. One was, um, given the way you charted the, at, at the beginning, this whole idea that Islamic art as a category itself uh, needs to be historicized, and you're linking it to obviously a certain kind of colonial movement and a disciplinary formation. Yeah. Uh, then if we are thinking about who are the practitioners that can be considered perhaps Islamic artists, or at least practitioners who are interested in negotiating the history of Islamic art, yeah. then is it necessary also uh, to go back and rethink the archive of Islamic art? Uh, because if we're contesting a certain category formation, then is it also incumbent on us to repopulate perhaps uh, that archive as a way of contesting it? And then of course, and look at different sites, not perhaps only monumental architecture or certain ornamental forms or certain calligraphic forms, but certain other perhaps everyday artistic practices or certain practices that we, haven't even, we don't even know yet how to look for. So that's one question. Speaking as a media historian, yeah. I'm interested yeah. in these things. And the other question was um, to think about two things that seem to be happening in the second half, which are very, very fascinating for any of us who are thinking about art in South Asia, which is how um, difficult it is to uncouple the religious and the national. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just reading this new essay by Lotte Hook, uh, where she's discussing Zainal Abidin and him moving again outside of South Asia within a certain moment when modernism is being taught. Um, and then again now he's connected to Bangladesh. So what is the way in which one is able to think of some of these questions? And what are the tensions here with, that the artists themselves are dealing with and that are becoming so difficult for us in our conceptualizing, conceptualization? The religious question, the national question, yeah. and then having to fit perhaps or then unfit uh, canons outside of those questions. No, thank you both. You know, excellent questions. Um, so regarding kind of the formative, you know, kind of let's say the archive or canon of Islamic art. Yeah, absolutely. So um, and there are two ways to extend it, right? Um, one is uh, geographically. And uh, it's actually several ways. So one is geographically to think about. So the way Islamic art developed as a category, it looked at basically more or less kind of art in the Arab world and Turkey and Iran. Okay, even India was somewhat marginal. Even the Taj Mahal was kind of marginal, you know, in the initial conception. So, but you know, in a sense that um, 
uh, you know, now people are looking more at uh, not at sub-Saharan Africa, right, at, uh, at Indonesia, places like that, at China, right? So there's a way in which there's a geographic uh, expansion. And when you have that geographic expansion, it also, um, uh, the, the, the question of kind of fixed categories to the canon also come under pressure, right? So, you know, there's a mosque in China, okay, that's going to look pretty different from a mosque in, you know, Istanbul, you know? So, uh, so how do you, in a, in a sense, how do you make sense of that? Or, or places like Ethiopia or Armenia, right, where there is, you know, there are ways in which you can think about Islamic art as a kind of a mobile, you know, it's a, it's a set of mobile kind of, let's say, practices, you know, and fragmentary and mobile practices rather than as these kind of fixed and finished panels, right? So that's one way to think about it. Second is the, te the question of time, right, which I mentioned that it's mysteriously stops at the year 1800. Mm -hmm. So what do you do after that, right? In some sense, that, that's maybe my problem at some level, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, and then the third, of course, is the mediums that you look at, right? So that's absolutely the case that, uh, you know, it was focused on luxury objects primarily, right? Monumental architecture and luxury objects. So what do you do with things that are no longer, you know? First of all, you know, there, there are problems, though, because a lot of other <coughs> stuff doesn't survive, right? Um, and uh, what, but even if you can find things that survive, how do you think about them in relation to kind of quote unquote Islamic art? So, so yeah, so in all of these ways, and probably there are other ways to kind of, in a sense, you know, question and problematize, you know, what we mean historically by that, and all that work needs to be done, I think, okay, uh, as a way to. Uh, but what I'm, what I'm making the argument is that what artists, what artists are doing today through their practice is a kind of a, a is a long durée decolonization of the category, if you want to think about the category, right, and the, the concept. And they do it without necessarily providing, you don't get a formulaic answer after looking at an artist's practice as to where they stand in relation to, it's inhabiting a problem and dwelling in it and thinking about it in through practice without necessarily arriving at a closed finished form answer, right, okay, so that's part of the difficulty, okay. Uh, but I think if we don't even recognize that, if we don't even recognize that there is the need to kind of re-inhabit your, you know, like the, 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 the burden that you are, you know, that the, the burden of tradition, the burden of your subjectivity, the burden of your upbringing and your background, then I think a lot of artists are trying to do that in a very intuitive way, okay? Uh, if you talk to many of these artists, they actually won't be able to, uh, they don't think, they, they won't necessarily be able to articulate, you know, what they're doing in, kind of a very, uh, 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 a language that uh, sees their own journey at, at, as, they'll talk about processes, they'll talk about the nitty gritty of processes, you know, without necessarily taking a, a view, you know, an overview, okay. Um, and uh, uh, so, so that's one thing, the, the, the question of disentangling religion from, but I would say why do you want to disentangle, in other words, isn't religion a problem to inhabit and think seriously about rather than to pretend that it doesn't exist, right? In other words, that's the problem for artists in Pakistan, that you can't really pretend that there is a secular sphere, you know, that is separate and strong enough to kind of, you know, so, so you know, what do you do as an artist? You can make those claims. If you talk to artists, they'll make all sorts of, like, you know, if you talk to them about their political position or whatever, they give crazy answers, you know? So, you know, like there are artists who love Imran Khan, you know, for example, which, which is always like people I respect otherwise, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, okay. so, uh, so there's no, there's no, you know, you don't get any, you have various positions people take, but they're all positions that are information, in other words, right. Um, and in terms of disentangling uh, the question of nationalism, I think nationalism is a big burden for, you know, for the last 70 years, it's been a, a terrible burden. And I think uh, partly what I try to show in my that the modernism book, and I, I think also through these practices, is that uh, that in some ways, let's say, is, Islam in Pakistan has a specific, like, it has a it has a certain hegemonic, uh, you know, hold on society. It has a certain uh, fragmented set of formations that weigh very heavily on you know on society, right? And uh, that may be different from when you go to Bangladesh. It will have another kind of a, you know, uh, a formation. So, uh, so it's important, of course, for artists. They work intuitively and they work with based on what they, uh, you know, the, both the kind of the, the formal impulses as well as well as their training. A lot of artists are defined by their training, right? So they, 
they work in a way that they are trained. It's hard for them to, I mean, it's easy to work in the way you're trained. It's harder for you to kind of, you know, diverge from that, right? Uh, so in other words, that if they're trained in a very particular way, then we can't say that art is reflective of all society because the training may be quite particular. So do you see what I'm saying? So it's uh, so to read an art object as necessarily standing in for the whole of society is also not a good idea, right? For that reason, because like training and forms have their own like tunnel visions, right? In other words, right? Um, but it's but um, in some ways I think art is also uh, contemporary art. The world of contemporary art is also quite in some ways in South Asia is quite transnational, right? So in other words, that uh, that many artists show in India. Right, uh, there is increasing kind of exchange and dialogue that takes place despite very difficult borders. So there's a ways in which um, there's a way in which you can also imagine contemporary South Asian art, and there are ways to talk about it in some with some degree of kind of legibility and coherence. I think, yeah. So again, it's a project. A lot of people feel very strongly that they should not be seen only as national artists. Yes. I have a related question. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I mean, I, I'm particularly interested in how you look at artists working in the diaspora differently from artists who are primarily based in Pakistan. And certainly, um, with figures like Shamsa and Rashid Arain, um, and if we look at the other story as a kind of moment in which Rashid Arain is making a case for these this kind of coalition of broad. Um, new ethnicities who've been in England for a number of decades at that point, um, whose work is not just sort of being marginalized because of who they are, but also it's just not been acknowledged as art historically important. Mm -hmm. And um, and so very precisely those formal categories, the kind of um, innovation at the level of the grid or modular mm -hmm. sculpture, minimalist repetition, um, which even though there is a certain kind of coevalness with those things happening in Britain and Europe and America, certainly, mm -hmm. um, though that hasn't been acknowledged art historically. And so, um, in a way, that seeming quite separate from um, how that generation of contemporary artists that you spoke about, who certainly have um, a particular kind of access or a particular kind of relationship to these questions of the national public sphere and their their space within Karachi or the horror cities like that. Um, and and their relationship of course to contemporary art being a much more kind of fluid and acceptable yeah. um, negotiation. Um, and I say this also because someone like Rashid Arian's work doesn't sit comfortably even in a gallery where you look at it with Donald Judd and Robert Morris and all of these other people. I mean you can't quite Put, put it in the same place, even though in a polemical way that's the claim that he was making for his own work. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it's just kind of unformed as a question, but these are just yeah. thoughts that. I would say, I mean, I, I could have done this talk. I mean, Rashid is a good person for me to follow because he, it, it, like, it's very, one can trace his, you know, the argument very clearly, you know, but uh, one could make a kind of, I, I don't want to. I don't want to make too sharp a distinction between home and diaspora. In other words, in, in fact, I want to problematize it. And I want, because in, it's the case that many of the artists, for example, I could have done this talk instead of Rashid, perhaps talking about Sadatan and Zahur Laklak and Lala Rukh, okay? And, and that would give a picture, it would be a different reading, but in all of these cases, these are all artists who well, you know, Zahur Laklak studied abroad, you know, and Lala Rukh studied at the University of Chicago. So there's a way in which, you know, um, Lala Rukh is very interested in South Asian feminism, right? And she's, uh, you know, very interested as an activist. She goes and works with, like, Sri Lankan feminist activists, Bangladeshi feminist activists, et cetera, like, has lots of friends in India. So there's ways, I think, also that uh, one could, um, and they, and both uh, Zahur and Lala Rukh make a transition from kind of modernist kind of you know training to kind of more contemporary practice, right? So, so I guess what I'm saying is that I could uh, I could make an argument for this. Uh, I could make a, not the same argument, but it I could arrive you know where I'm arriving, okay, without necessarily only relying on on Rashid. 
That's what I'm saying. Okay, Nasheed gets under particular uh, you know issue because everyone says you are a Muslim artist. That's why you make geometric work. Mm -hmm. But nobody cares about that question in Pakistan. You see what I'm saying? Okay, in, in that in the same way that so Rashid feels the pressure much more acutely. Okay. I just had a yeah. more like a clarification question to follow up yeah, from what you said earlier about yeah. religion. Is there a distinction to be made between how the artist is thinking about religion in the public sphere and how one is reading that work within the within the public sphere? So, for example, when we look at the Pishti Sevar yeah. uh, things, I mean, that's definitely a critique of. Uh, Hanavi's text, yeah. right? And so, I don't know if it's a critique. Well, so I mean, an I, interesting. Um, how I, shall we say? I'm not sure if artists do critique, or if they do critique, they do it pretty badly. <laughs> I mean, I think that critique is not a good way to think about art. I mean, there's a chastity <laughs> belt and so on and so forth, right? If I'm not mistaken in that, I mean, I don't recall. Yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, so. It, it seems to me more about what the confining idea of what it is to be. Just I'm giving an example. But confining is also defining, right? In right, other words, right. that what confines you also makes you possible, right? In a way, so I think it's about uh, it's about what you know. I mean, one reading would be yeah. that you know it is it is social forces that shape you as a as a woman and as an individual, and in some ways that shaping is in extrapolable from. From uh, the, the question of subjectivity is so the, it's not a liberal subject, you know. Right, it's right, not right. a liberal subject that is already, um, it, uh, you know, has its own uh, kind of uh, I, I, I independence in, right. in uh, against social uh, against society. Right. You right, see what right, I'm saying? Right. No. So, so I got that. And Thalvi would say the same thing. So I'm not sure if it's a critique of Thalvi. Well, okay. Okay. Well, let's okay. say it complicates uh, Thalvi. Yeah. But yeah. then when one when yeah. you're reading it and juxtaposing it to artists say working in the diaspora as we've been talking about, yeah, yeah. are there how shall we say different understandings of Islam that you are bringing to uh, like at work in your readings of this? Yeah. So in other words, th this is not really about Islam at all at some level, right? Because yeah. it's not about. Um, it's not about uh, let's say settling, you know, either you know how how should one be a good Muslim or you know right. none of this is about that, right? In yeah. fact, most of these people are not necessarily good Muslims in the way they live their lives, mm -hmm. right? In, in the way that you know many of them drink and so on, you know. So, right. So in other words, they're not yeah. necessarily many of them don't practice. So it, you know, the question is not about um, the question is not about whether this is about that engagement with this. Problem or this burden is necessarily an engagement that uh, leads to uh, ethical betterment on Islamic terms. Okay, it's not about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so if it's it's not about making you know a work that will make you feel more spiritual or it will make you feel more like being a better Muslim. You know, it's not at all about that. Right. So then, what are the ethical terms that? Right, the the you know there there is there is perhaps an ethics to this practice, but it is not a traditional Islamic est uh, ethics, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I think it's an uh, ethics of inhabiting the present, which with, with burden with this legacy, and with with the with, with, with a kind of an oppressive present, right? Mm -hmm. And without knowing knowing intuitively that secularism doesn't doesn't work, but it doesn't yeah. work in your context. Right. I think that's the problem. I see. Okay. I think, but this is speculation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, so my question is kind of tailing on to a lot of questions that have already been raised, but I wanted to ask a more theoretically programmatic yeah. theory, sure, sure. Uh, question in that, you know, the title of your presentation is Islamic Art versus and, and the Secular, right? And I kind of see that as a versus in some ways. Yeah. But that kind of becomes even more clear when you're um, talking about uh, the contemporary period, where it seems as if the the art practices that you're talking about mostly appear in public space, or there's something to do with the public, or counter publics, mm -hmm. or multiple mm -hmm. publics, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if the verses that I sense in in the overall title. Um, if that implies that Islam, in some way, is a private endeavor, and and or if there's a breach in the contemporary period, where 
the contemporary artwork somehow breaches the, the, the religious aspect between the private and the public sphere. I'm yeah. not making too much sense, but I feel, yeah. feel like there's like these four corners of like the Islamic, the secular, <coughs> the pu private, the public, and I'm trying to see how they overlap and contradict in yeah. terms of... That's why I think this post-secular turn is helpful. You mm -hmm. know? Uh, and that's not coming out of art history, yet, you know. It's really coming out of religious studies and anthropology, you know, for the most part, which is problematizing these distinctions, right? Which is saying that the way you divide the, sec the private, the, the public, the secular, and the and the religious is not so. It's much more entangled, right? And uh, and that you and that that that, that is, this was always a kind of a working fiction, if you will, to say there is a there is the private realm and the public realm, and there is the Habermasian public sphere, and there is the private, you know, so, and, and especially, you know, it may be even a working fiction in the West, you know, it may work pretty well, but it doesn't really work in, in the same way in, you know, when you, when you go to Pakistan, you know, so, uh, or when you go to Turkey today, for example, right, so, um, so I think these are real, I think these are real issues, I mean, I think the, I think the theoretical turn in this way is important because it helps us, I don't have, I, I don't have, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm, as you can see, I'm still thinking through all of this. So I'm not, I'm not saying that it provides us with. Um, so it, it, it the the the, the, the post-secular turn is criti criticized, right? By let, let's say leftists, like Sabah Mahmood was criticized a lot by feminists as well as by leftists, right? And what would they say to her? They would say you are giving uh, ammunition to the uh, to the right wing. Okay, you are giving ammunition to the uh, you know, we are fighting the battle for liberalism and secularism in Pakistan or wherever, and what you're doing is you are actually, by your work, you are, uh, you are, uh, you are supporting women's uh, confinement, right? You're not supporting women's liberation, right? So, uh, and I think that, you know, so in other words, her, her work doesn't offer any uh, program, right? What it does is it helps you think more deeply about the predicament you're in. You know, and I think that's what art is doing in another way, right? And I, you know, that that's what I'm trying to say. And I think this whole question of, you know, the, like in Pakistan, it was always, I mean, Manan has done a lot of work on this, right? In the, you know, like even historically and in terms of literature, you know, these things were entangled and they emerged in a, in in a, in a greater force in like after the 70s or something like that. But these were latent, you know, from the very beginning, I think, and probably from from reform movements <coughs> that begin in the 19th century, basically, right? Uh, or you can go back to Shah Waliullah or even Ibn Taymiyyah, you know? So in other words, this is part of, this is not something nationalism exacerbates these, but these are, you know, and the same thing is going on in Hinduism, right? Hinduism, you know, what you see in terms of Modi today is not, Modi didn't just suddenly erupt, you know? It's part of what is happening with kind of reform movements and contestations within Hinduism. Uh, in, in a way that even religion gets defined. I mean, that's what the post-secular turn is helpful because it says religion gets defined in a, in a particular way in relation to, 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 to modern institutions, okay? And the way it gets defined, it gets entangled, you know, in all sorts of ways with, you know, with, with education, with subjectivity, with liberal, you know, with liberalism, right? With political formations. I, is this, I mean, I, I, I didn't answer your question, but I don't know if I can. Well, so let me just thank you, Tahir, that, that was really thought provoking. I, I have a question which is kind of, um, I'm trying to think through your programmatic, uh, my, the question just now, and I'm also kind of thinking about Koopa's question. Yeah. Um, and. One of the things that um, in the contemporary artists that you uh, focused on, I'm thinking about the 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 '99 uh, image and series. Yeah, yeah, Hamra and, and, and uh, yeah. Vuzu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I'm, and and there's so and there's definitely something which is about Pakistan and about the particular genesis of religion and politics that it, as you said in your programmatic part. The 70, 70 years. Um, but is it that when we conceive of the, the imagination, the kind of sacral imagination in these particular artworks, which is, I like just say, quite conservative, as it is, it's, it's, it's an imagination that uh, takes on board a certain vision of what 
constitutes the sequel. Yeah. And if we contrast it even with someone like Emma Fassan, and we kind of kind of think of the kind of iconography that could uh, lend itself to reinterpretation. Yeah. Um, or even slightly earlier with Sadi Khan, etc. Right. Uh, I wanted to. I was kind of very curious about your. About you, I was kind of be, uh, interested in the response you had to Krupa, where these artists have either problem or difficulty, as you were saying, expressing themselves, explaining themselves what they are, or they may not be Muslims, or they may not have whatever other kind of practices of the self. And I, 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 I want to see what is the relationship then between. This avowed, I, I have some of these artists are friends of mine, I've had these conversations with them, but what this avowed liberal subjecthood, mm -hmm. this art that seems to not cross certain lines at the same time as it is obviously doing something in the public, very public sphere. Um, and yet I, I, I see some, some disjuncture in how this art, in, especially in Pakistan, especially in the kind of the, 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 the your contemporary portion of your talk, um, remains um, yeah, yeah, the remains. There's something that's holding, in my viewing of the work you're yeah, saying, yeah. holding it back. And what is it? What is happening where this this the, this idea of playing with the tradition remains defined by certain very very kind of Some, some some very boundaries. I mean, if we compare it to so, what are those boundaries? Like, uh, just give me some examples. So um, you know, I mean, for Emma Fussain would 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 had a whole series where you know they're they're Krishna and other yeah other, yeah uh, uh, yeah iconographic figures were yeah. part of the rethinking something like uh, Hiranja or something like that. Right? So you have kind of a, a reworking yeah, of, yeah. of iconography across different kinds of yeah. uh, sacred lines. Uh, yeah. I was also I was just reminded of uh, there was a there was something that went on um, for sale at Christie's the other day because Christie's had a big sale of South Asia and there was a um, uh, Mary and, and, and child that uh, that came out of uh, John Hughes Court that was sold and I was like you know just thinking of, and it was the Mary is like a you know Rajasthani woman basically. And I was I was just stunned by the, yeah, the that. So that that's thing. the beginning of my talk. That Islamic art is not Islamic. No, no, yeah, no. It doesn't have it doesn't have iconography. But that's so, not that's <laughs> not, but that's not what it's it's it it is a relationship with iconographic representation of a different, avowedly understood sacral practice, right? So Mary is not entering the mobile stream yeah. as a form without meaning. She's entering with formal meaning attached to her. You see what I mean? So it's not Islamic art, but it's definitely Christian art. And that Christian yeah, art... Yeah, so Christian art exists in a way that Islamic art doesn't. Right. Right? right. Because so, so, Christian... So that, that, exactly. So that's right. done. As yeah. in that's, it, yeah. that's a way of thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. And if you come to these contemporary artists, yeah. the if they're going to use wuzu, yeah. Practice, yeah. Ninety nine names, yeah. Practice, yeah. Right, Bashti Zaber, a type of practice, right, of right. The social reform. But right. they're taking these practices, they're still very much defining that practice within a um, sacral, understood, sacral kind of conversation with the public, and especially as they're public. Uh, th these examples are public facing yeah. uh, works. Uh, so one thing I would say is that art does very little. Okay, first of all. So to, in other words, it's it's better not. It's better to acknowledge that art can't do much. Okay. So if you begin again with a ground like that, then you your ambitions are modest in terms of what art is actually capable of doing in terms of social addressing social transformations or injustices. Well, but, but, but no, no, I'm not. I'm, not, I'm simply talking about the artists. What are artists doing here? And your in your so I mean I don't see. I'm not sure why you think that. Like, do, I mean, the, you know, should they be including, let's say, Hindu? And like, I'm not sure what, you know, which art some artists do, like Anwar Said, he does that in his work, which I didn't show here. Mm -hmm. No, that's what I'm asking. Right? I'm asking, I'm asking. So there are people who do this, they look at, like, the legacies that are denied in Pakistan, right. like, you know, kind of Hindu iconography and so on. There are artists dealing with that, right? But, uh, um, 
to the degree that my talk was focused on the problem of Islam, I chose works that, right. that focus on this, right? I mean, in the sense that there are plenty of artists who don't care about Islam, right. okay? And for them, their practice can't be understood in, right. necessarily in this way. But to the degree that this talk, you know, was about yeah. this problem, then th this is the s kind of the selection of work. And even some of these artists, Hamra does all sorts of work, mm -hmm. right? But this is the work that I think <coughs> speaks most, you know, kind of to, practice. to this, the topic of this talk and the, the, the questions that I'm thinking. But having said that, I don't think, you see, I mean, the thing is that, uh, so let, let me be blunt, okay? I'll say that you are critiquing the artist for being too circumscribed, too timid, okay? And not necessarily engaging very deeply with the, with the ideological and, uh, and social dislocations of Pakistan, right? And I absolutely agree with you, okay? But I think that to ask that of any artist is, you can't, you can't tell an artist what, like they only go to make what they feel they can make. So in other words, it's the, if they make anything else, it's going to be propaganda and postering. You see what I'm saying? Like you can make, you can make, you can put Hindu icons on a poster and say we should, everyone is, all religions are equal. But that's not really a work that comes out of a heartfelt. You see what I'm saying? Like I'm not sure. Which, if, is, which is still the statement, right? right? That, but, if, that but, there are certain things that do not come out is still a discursive statement. But you can only make work about what, like when, what you feel. If you feel that, I that's mean, that's precisely what right. I'm saying. That's exactly. What but I'm saying. but you can't expect. I mean, in a sense that you know, art works at the level of affect, right? It works at the level of suggestion, affect, totally. and sensory yeah. kind of it. So it doesn't work at the level of. It works very badly at the level of explicit, uh, you know, kind of programmatic, ideological, and social statements. Yeah, okay, so yeah, so uh, your question is an unfair one as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, since you two have to have dinner together, I think we should move on before, uh, before uh, the dinner guests. Um, yeah, yes, okay. For me, just think, I'm not an art historian, yeah, yeah. Or, and it's especially contemporary things, I'm very little. But for me, the issue is about why is it that we like to call everything Islamic if it deals with Muslims, Muslim societies, or Muslim majority countries? Mm -hmm. When you look at the counterpart, let's say Catholic Catholicism, yeah. you look at Italian artists, French artists, and you hear me say Italian artist, French artist. Or if you go to South America, Colombian artists, right? We call them something else. We don't call them Catholic artists. Right. Right? Why can't we do that with in the context of Muslims all across the world? Like why can't we call them Pakistani artists? Why can't we call them Pakistani British artists or Pakistani American artists? I mean, yes, it doesn't mean that I think the engagement with religion is an important one. Mm -hmm. And I understand the tensions that you're drawing out, right? Mm -hmm. You're living in a society where these things are known, wazoo is known, um, you know, the the ways in which architecture performs itself and how you draw on certain certain spaces, right? Like these yeah. things are tensions. Yeah. But even in in Catholic art or in Italian art or in French art, the same tensions arise, right? Like they have tensions between what you can show in the public sphere in terms of, because you're in a religious society, in a Catholic religious yeah. society, what you're able to show yeah. and what you're, what you're supposed to censor or not show or let only yeah. be private. Right? So yeah. for me, that's the issue. Like, why do we have to call it Islamic? Like, yeah. just call so it I don't want to call anyone anything, right? In the sense that mm -hmm. I'm not interested in, in a taxonomy and labeling. Right? I mean, not, but why, right? why does the question even right. arise? It arises because you you think through categories, right? Because if you substitute Pakistan for Islam, you don't get out of the problem of categorization. You see what I'm saying? Then you're burdened with what Pakistan means. Okay? So in other words, so I'm saying rather than do away with categories, it's better to inhabit them critically. Okay? And a lot of these artists take a lot of, uh, would take a lot of offense if you call them Islamic artists. Okay? Right. And I would not call them Islamic artists. I'm saying their work, I'm not calling them Islamic artists. I'm saying their work in certain modalities deal with the problem of quote unquote Islamic art in two ways that I talked about in the beginning. You know, one is the ways of formal uh, kind of uh, relationships to quote unquote Islamic art, which would be things like the, the heritage of calligraphy, carpets, okay, um, you know, architecture, etc. right? So that's one a kind of a formal 
and you know and the second is the the problem of inhabiting the world today as being muslim and if they do that if they were partially does that to whatever degree then it to me the a kind of a critical category of what islamic art is might make sense to address those aspects of their work but they may equally be queer at the same time they may be you know they may be they may be formalists at the same time they may be kind of you know in, a, in other words it doesn't it's not an exclusive it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a it's it's a conceptual investigative term it's not a taxonomy okay i don't i'm not interested in taxonomy okay uh, roger and then you should much for the presentation. I guess my question was more conceptual, thinking about Talal Saad and Naveed Khan's work. Yeah, you're yeah. Tackling them, especially since the Saad is so focused in many ways on limitations, how things become limited within a particular time in right. relationship to the past, yeah. the present as convivial with the past. Yeah. And Naveed Khan is thinking about this. So continues becoming into a future. Right, right. Which then doesn't allow you actually, in some ways, to inhabit the tension you're talking about if an artist is inhabiting a productive tension in the present, then how is it already moving forward? I think Assad and the Khan might be a little bit, uh, not, there might be a little bit of friction there. Sure, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah. And I was wondering how you yeah. thought about it. Yeah, I'm not sure there's a friction. In other words, that, you know, uh, Assad is thinking about, well, Assad is thinking about, you know, I mean, he has that famous essay, Islam as a discursive tradition. And in some ways, he's expanded on that, right? And uh, which he talks about that. Um, and uh, you know, in a, in a sense, that unfolds, right? So, in, in, you know, it has a future. In Assad's project has a futurity to it, which is delimited in some ways delimited by the questions that have already been asked, right? And it may unfold. In, so, so, in other words, text, it's, it, it's so it's so foundational. It's the founding text, Quran and Hadith. No, no, no. It's not the founding text for. That's what it, he says in the idea of the anthropology. It's a founding, founding text, but it the the, the it's it's it, their founding text to the degree. First of all, he deals with theology primarily. Right, and I deal with literature and art. So, but I think the he's helpful for my project, and I'll explain how. So, for Quran and Hadith may be foundational texts, but they don't exist in a vacuum. Right, they exist as through a through a continuous process of interpretation. Okay, which it, whatever whatever point in history that you inhabit, whatever sub kind of lineage of kind of tradition you look at, you're going to find kind of certain arguments, certain relationships to the Quran and Hadith. For example, right. And that has a futurity to it. Okay, not just a past, but also a kind of a vector towards, oriented towards the future. So I'm not sure if, uh, I mean, Navida Khan is not really a post-secular thinker, but I think that book is important in the in the sense of she's thinking about all the she's thinking about all the problems that Pakistan is facing, sectarianism and violence and all of that, right? And and. Uh, like what? What are the, what are like? Her book comes. I think it came at a time. And what are the kind of alternative? You have the failed state paradigm. Right? Pakistan is a failed state. Okay, uh, it's a theological state. Okay, there are all sorts of paradigms that have been floated, which don't actually explain very much. You know, because Pakistan is actually not a failed state. Right? It's actually, I think, you know, in terms of its bureaucracy, is quite you know uh, established and powerful. You know, the army is quite established and powerful. Right. Um, Pakistan is not a theological state because there is no one theology that rules in Pakistan. It's actually riven with uh, conflict. Okay, so uh, so how do you so how do you explain this kind of this the fact that there is no settled ideology, right? I mean, there is a kind of a settled ideology, but it's basically empty. Okay, uh, it's a kind of a it's an empty signifier which people try to fill with kind of all sorts of clashing interpretations and versions, right? So that itself is a process of experimentation, right? And, and which is not premised on liberal terms necessarily. Many of the groups that are participating in this are not, uh, you know, term, you know, working on terms that are liberal. I think Kajiri Jain's work in this respect is important also because she is looking at what's happening, let's say, with Hindu religiosity, you know, gods, you know, statues of gods in like parks, you know, or. Or religious posters and how they intersect with both kind of let's say communitarian and you know subgroup claims, okay, as well as vernacular capitalism, right? So I don't think the Pakistani situation is unique in that respect. Uh, India, you know, in some ways, you know, it, it, India, you know, in, in, in Hinduism, you may have 
you could come, you could text, you could think about what's happening in Pakistan to what I mean. There are differences, of course. That India doesn't have the degree of sectarianism Pakistan has, you know, in terms of its internal religious, you know, strife. But the, the question very much is that these are processes of experimentation and becoming, okay? And in, on one hand, kind of in a sense, uh, circumscribed by the, by, the, uh, by the nation state framework and the limits of that. On the other hand, there are all sorts of crazy aspirations that, you know, that, 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 that are defined by this nation state framework and yet go in crazy ways beyond it, okay? Beyond the kind of the, the rules of the game. The liberal uh, nation state framework so that that's what's happening i think and in that sense i think uh, you know i'm i know the Nida khan is not a post-secular thinker in the same way that you know but i for me i don't i'm not sure if there is a i mean i think both taral asad and Navida khan do different things for my project but i don't not necessarily sure if they are like at odds with each other i'm, I'm I, I don't know I, I at least i didn't see it that way <laughs> okay no, just okay, okay. So, final question, please, Shai. Yeah, it's, it's more of a comment. Um, I find the, the lecture was immensely productive. And I thank you. Um, I want to continue in the moment about the coeval uh, institution together with uh, the Donald Judd, in, in the sense of, or in conjunction with the moment when, I'm sorry that I don't remember anybody's name. I think that was okay, it's okay. Notes, but the guy who says, you can only make this art because you're a Muslim. Oh, uh, yeah, Rashid Arain. Yeah. But I'm saying that um, it strikes me that one story we, I at least could have taken away from this lecture is a story about racism. I mean, they wanted to be modernist. They wouldn't let them show. And the right. shows at some point you realize it's because you're brown yeah. and you become contemporary. Yeah. Another story, which I think, I'm not saying you didn't say this, Martin. Another thought that I had while I was listening to this material is about how these different generations of people are interrogating modernism. How their uh, yeah. experience coming to the West is sort of putting a mirror to ideas of modernism itself. And I, I want to contribute in, to this line of point to say, it strikes me that the same utterance towards a Muslim person doesn't work towards a Jewish person. Mm -hmm. I'm saying the same kind of material that is derided, the, I mean, you're doing this because you're a Muslim, I eat. Uh, pattern, anachronicity, etc. Mm -hmm. It's exactly the same material that is lauded to the skies by Clement Greenberg when Jewish people do it in uh, after yeah, Mark. Barnett Newman or somebody. somebody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the heights of modernism <laughs> okay. can be inhabited by exactly the kind of thing that is derided as non modern yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm just saying that that to me is a, is a productive way. Like, right. That is an interesting yeah. place where yeah. it's not so much about brown people failing to inhabit modernism, but modernism failing and, and brown people pointing to its failure. Or, or yeah. I'm sorry if that sounds racist, but I'm, I'm just saying yeah. a, a, a working through and a, and a critique of modernist assertions themselves. Yeah. No, thank you for that. I mean, thank you. That's, um, I have to think more about it. For me, you know, modernism is, um, so there, there are kind of, let's say, there, is a, there, is a, there are claims within modernism that are completely universal. And that's why I think that artists from all over the world, okay, let's think of, think of it this way. You know, when you have kind of European art that is still tied to kind of um, uh, the Beaux art kind of, you know, training, right? Fig you know, go and copy Greek, you know, like go for two years and, you know, go to the grand tour and copy, you know, <laughs> learn live drawing, you know, etc. right? And it's only, so how, like how, you know, that of course is replicated in art schools in the 19th century, let's say in India, okay? But really what happens with modernism is it's a great opening because modernism itself is a, has a kind of a global orientation because when you look at the way all modern art, like modernism emerges, it emerges from Partly by looking outside Europe, so the impressionists are looking at the Japanese print. Okay, Gauguin is, you know, like to primitivism. Okay, Picasso is looking at, you know, the African masks. Okay, any number of artists are looking at. Matisse is looking at Islamic art. Clay is looking at Islamic art. Right. So there's a way in which um, even the, let's say, the canonical European modernist artists are uh, fashioning their projects it, to some degree by looking outside of Europe. Right, and so it becomes, and they and they abandon the window to the world. They abandon the figurative realist, uh, okay, and that is immensely liberating because the rest of the world doesn't have that to begin with, you know. So it's much more, and it's a, it's a much more hospitable and enabling platform for people, at least in theory, 
for people to enter. When they actually enter and practice, they find that it's institutional, you know, investments. You know, MoMA, who's all, MoMA has already bought a lot of, you know, Barnett Newman, or you know, they're not going to buy a Japanese artist who. You see what I'm saying? Right? So, so there are those kinds of investments that come into play. I think, and you know, art historical investments. You know, here we are at Columbia. You know, I mean, the, the art history department is still not globally oriented here. You know, I think. So, so you know, in other words, that Columbia has a, you know, was a big you know, kind of, you know, like from the days of, uh, you know, kind of in, in a sense, it's been a department that has been invested in a certain story of kind of modern art, which is canonical, right? And, it, it, you know, to the degree that they challenged the canon, it was still by looking at surrealists and, you know, people like that, right? So in other words, that you have those kinds of institutional investments that can, that keep the game going. So, so I think that's what, you know, so on the one hand, there is the, the promise, the universal, global promise of modernism. On the other hand, there is the realities on the ground that these artists negotiate and they don't find it easy to do. So, yeah. 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 Very, very quickly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it doesn't really make sense. So it doesn't really have anything to do with Islamic art, apart from perhaps about the kind of historicity of the category. Yeah. Because, so what's always struck me about the Stuart Hall, the familiar stranger book, is the extraordinary like call of modernism. Like that kind of he says something like any of the four marks that like, reminded him that all these things were universal and made him opposition and stuff. Yeah. And there were generations, like you said, of artists who responded. This is this is who? Stuart Hall. Yeah, 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 stranger yeah, yeah. In the yeah. early days. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And there are generations of artists who respond to this. Um, at first, might be people like Anne Bowling, Sousa, right, right, etc. Right, right, right. And they too go through a disillusion. Yeah. And yet the dissolution leads to a, a recommitment to the kind of modernist, pure idea of it, in yeah. some sense, especially yeah. for Bowling, but also I think to some extent for Sousa. Yeah. And then the the second generation who respond to it don't. But there might also be other kinds of reasons why that is, because for Rashid Ari and for Bula Mona the two, the, the kind of shift happens in a kind of in the new Thatcherite context where political blackness is is being articulated. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. To, and then the defunding of our institutions. Yeah, 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 yeah. And only really later would this become possible maybe to describe as Islamic art or like, I don't, I don't know how, how the history of the art would work for the earlier period. <coughs> yeah, so it, I mean, Islamic art is never a big thing in, in the British context, mm. right, in contemporary. I mean, that's, it, this is my reading. I mean, yeah. It's not necessarily a reading that even Rashid agrees with. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Um, although he's read the chapter, he liked what I wrote. But he was very, you know, he did not want to be, he, he does not want to be identified as a Muslim artist or in, uh, you know, working mm -hmm. in Islamic art, right? He's very clear about that. And, uh, uh, but on the other hand, he, I think he, 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 in his practice, he does all sorts of things that, you know, that he doesn't say, you know, that he, you know, he repudiates in, you know, like in, if you talk to him, you mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? Like, so he's a, um, so he's interesting for me in that respect. Uh, but I think it happens before Thatcher, because Thatcher is the 80s, but their politicization begins in the early 70s, mm -hmm. you know, and of course by the time you have, you know, the, the Thatcher years are of course, you know, where it consolidates, black British really consolidates in the 80s, not in the 70s mm -hmm. to some degree, but they are being politicized by the early 70s already, yeah. yeah. And of course they, you know, as more time goes by, they have been. But why do you think there's a big difference between a bowling or a Sousa who kind of continue with the medium of painting even after disillusionment? And That's the first generation. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, they just want to be artists, okay? <laughs> okay. And people like Rashid also want to be artists, but they realize that they can't do it because they have to, uh, they have to become critical and mount institutional critique because they, it it is not about the individual trajectory, you know, because mm -hmm. the decks are stacked, uh, you know, institutionally against you. And of course, they are they all like you know. They, they read Feno and people like that at a time when the other people, like the first generation, mm -hmm. didn't necessarily, right? So there's also a way in which they're enabled by kind of, let's say, post-colonial thinking, you know, critique. Uh, that, that kind of begins to emerge in the early 70s. It doesn't really happen in the same way before that. I mean, there are, of course, people who are critical and are theorizing and so on, but I think, I think the, the, the discovery of Feno is a big thing for for like Rashid, you know, and, and for people like David Medina, you know, who was a, who, who actually studied at Columbia, you know, I think he got his PhD, like his PhD at the age of 16 or something, or from Columbia, it was something crazy. <laughs> he was this, uh, 
and uh, so he was friends. He was friends with uh, with, uh, with Rashid, and uh, then Rashid joins the Black Panthers. You know, so there's a way in which they, you know, so what's happening in the U.S. in terms of race relations also gets inflected in, you know, and that politicization also kind of comes to a head in the late 60s onwards. So, yeah. Yeah. well, <laughs> uh, uh, Scar, thank you very much for that talk. Thank you all for for joining us. Before um, we uh, give. Uh, Professor Dadi, a, a round of applause. Let me say a few things. Um, first of all, thanks to the um, South Asia Institute and the Institute for Af African Studies, uh, which co-sponsored this event and this series. Um, uh, also, let me highlight the fact that uh, the next event that our CPL is hosting in this um, series on rethinking public religion in African South Asia is, is actually happen happening on Thursday. Um, my colleague Mohammed Mezian has organized a, a workshop and roundtable on uh, North Africa and Africa, looking at the relationship between, um, especially Algeria, but um, other countries in North Africa vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East and Africa. Uh, so please do come along to that. The details are on our website. Um, but and. Last of all, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's uh, really wonderful to see some, some new faces around the table, at least for me, and to hear uh, <laughs> the, the depths of this knowledge about various traditions of art, about which I know very little and have really enjoyed hearing about. So uh, thank you all, and, and thanks to well, Scott Thank you all. Thank you.